What I'm doing right now is this is uh, part three of uh, energy. Th that is the ultimate question is when was the last time you actually felt well? And that may be 25 years ago. Okay. Um, and um, going through the different types of issues of your symptoms. And then um, we had talked about uh, sentinel symptoms uh, of uh, issues such as you know, have, do you have a tick bite, any travel, any of these obvious things that uh, are involved with your history that give us a clue as to what's going on. Um, and then uh, after that, our second, our second week that we talked about this, we talked about uh, issues of medications that, can, that have implications for fatigue um, and um, why have another, I think part of our list today was going to go over that as well. So we'll go over that a second time. But there's a lot of medications that we take just because we're told to take it that actually can impact um, our, our basically the level of energy. Uh, another aspect we talked about that crossed over the first and second week was the issue of um, just your overall emotional state. And then we, we had shown through the uh, work of the athletes that um, the emotional state clearly has an impact on how we feel, but more importantly, it can be affected. In other words, there's a, they call it like it's, it, it, the, uh, the issue of fatigue from a mental, emotional standpoint is soft wired. That means that what, you, what you actually occurs to you during that phase and how you think about things has an impact on how much fatigue you have. And um, uh, we, we had, uh, there were experiments done by uh, trained athletes, and the trained athletes um, had a specific uh, energetic uh, levels in certain parts of the brain for specific areas, and the patients who were um, not athletes at all um, they had, they were uh, wired up and all four levels were highly stimulated, okay, but the athletes were not. Only three were stimulated, the, the fourth was not stimulated, and what we found out through time, as those people who were already, uh, because they start off you know, as newbies, as they went through time and were trained, they also became like the athletic group, and they had a turn down on that fourth area um, of the brain, and for that reason, they felt less pain. They really felt less pain um, for the same activity. Um, so it was quite interesting, and that, that's been um, valued about for a few years now. I think that was around 2012. Um, and um, also, what I had previously done in the uh, second uh, talk was about laboratory testing and things like that. So um, one of the issues involved is uh, if, you, if a person is feeling a significant amount of fatigue, we have to evaluate uh, several areas. Uh, the first thing is sleep. Think about tiredness. Tiredness can be broken down into lots of different adjectives, but primarily it's sleepiness or fatigue, the two primary uh, adjectives the patient will describe. So in that situation, how much sleep did that person get? We have a huge amount of uh, sleep apnea in this area. And it basically, anybody over 50 who's not skinny has is, is probably got something to it, okay? And that's the extreme over-exaggeration, but it's closer than you think. Um, and um, that has a massive impact on lifespan. I talked about that at length uh, well, in our first uh, talk. Uh, but to put it in a simple way, uh, if the patient does have sleep apnea, they really should have it evaluated and, and then have it treated. The treatment primarily is related through uh, CPAP and things like that. I'm not here to push CPAP, it's just simply when we get down to it, uh, they tell you lose weight. Well, nobody can lose weight instantaneously, so they end up with something. And we see tr dramatic results, you know. Um, the easiest way of phrasing the, the severity of, of that uh, point is uh, patients who have sleep apnea, uh, and this is well proven, they die about 10 years before their normal expected life, lifespan. And t the last 10 years of their life um, are not good because everyone's thinking they've got Alzheimer's, but they don't. It's, they're, having a, they're having a progressive uh, memory loss that is reversible. So this is a big deal. This has a major impact on lifespan, 
life has major impact on the family, all these issues. So that's why it's, it's very important to, uh, to evaluate. I have to tell you that years ago, I, I wasn't really that keen on it. I, you know, I knew, I knew what it was, I was aware of it. So what, you know? Until I had a patient I could not figure out. I just could not figure out what was wrong with this guy. I tried everything under the sun. And he came up with the idea that, you know, I don't know, maybe it's my sleep. I said, well, what do you mean? And then he went into it. He had a sleep apnea type presentation. Um, he had a, obviously a very significantly abnormal findings in the traditional study. And uh, he was fixed up. In six months, he was a new man. I mean, really, it was just amazing. So we're talking about like a guy who could be 70 years old and feel like he's 90. And in six months, um, they often, often are, their, their mentation is like they were 10 years before. It's amazing. So when you see this uh, and you can help the person out, uh, you know, that's, that's really good. And of course, you're avoiding the, mor the morbidity associated with all the, the head-on collisions. We have, you know, most of the people that you see that are, they fall asleep and have a head-on collision, it's not suicide, it's sleep apnea. It's related just to, they fall asleep at the wheel. So sleep apnea is a big issue because if we're talking about fatigue and we haven't even talked about sleep patterns, we really missed the boat, okay? Uh, so we take the big picture, we're looking at, did that person or is that person getting enough sleep, quality sleep? So that would be essentially at least five hours continuous. The, the typical routine is, oh yeah, I sleep, I get about oh, five, six, seven hours. And I go, well, okay, but how many hours do you sleep in a row? Uh, about two. Well, that's classic, that's, that's sleep apnea. So, so that person uh, gets transformed from getting two hours of sleep to at least five, if not six or seven, okay? So um, it's a big deal and think about this, and I mentioned this in the first session, Our, how, do we, how do we recover? How do we regenerate things? You know, that's through our period of sleep. I mean, sleep was meant for us to be there. It's, it wasn't like we just, somebody decided we sleep so many hours. It's, this is the way our bodies are made. That's our, it's in our DNA. So um, our brains are tied to the sun, you know, as far as the optic nerve uh, being stimulated. So all that is uh, really important. Um, now, so that's pretty much the two sessions in a nutshell. So here's our tree of life. And what's going on down here? A lot of energy. But the question is, what is it? Um, there is stuff going on that we have not really understood until the past 10 years. Bottom line is this. The soil is extremely important as far as our overall health. The soil, it, in its diversity, okay, of back, you know, basically different organisms, et cetera, gives you a greater degree of nutrients in that soil. Uh, that's why uh, it makes a lot of sense if you have your own garden, hey, all power to you, it's the best thing possible. You know what's going on, you've tested the soil, you know what you, the soil needs, and you replenish the soil, etc. And this tree of life here sounds nice, but this is, uh, this kind of like goes along with functional medicine. Um, there is another thing where, let's pretend this tree had each branch was a different type of problem. Well, let's say cardiology's here, GI's there, uh, kidneys there, hepatology's there. You, know, you get all these different subspecialties, okay? It's very nice. And each person thinks they're, they're head of the roost. The problem is that what they don't realize is that it's the same tree. And that we all are, our bodies are basically showing diff different variations of a theme and they just happen to say, oh, it's a cardiac problem because the heart's this way. And it's this type of problem. Now, I'm not just talking because this, now we're gonna go into uh, the, the true um, general of, uh, of energy and that's the mitochondria. Okay, so the mitochondria are the tiny little cells that are, and they're, orga they're organelles that are in our cells. Are they important? Yes. That's where our energy comes from even when it comes to the neurobehavioral side of lack of energy and fatigue, it all also has to do with that because the neurons are all fed by and controlled by the, um, the, the energy that comes from the mitochondria. So, 
here's our little, this is a different way of looking at a continuum of life. Um, but it's kind of interesting. Here we are at age 15, 20, whatever, 25, and we're, we're just the studs of the world. And uh, as time goes on, uh, we change. Uh, this here, I hope this thing's not going to die on me. Um, here we get in the middle where we have dysfunction, um, and then we get the diagnoses of disease. So, you know, from traditional medicine, often we see the patient, they're already halfway down the ladder, you know? And, and so this is not helping the patient out too much because we're getting them at the end of the, end of the line, so to speak. It's kind of like if you had a car set up and I mean, the engine's already in and everything's all set to go and you just got to do a few more things and you're all set to get this thing offline. And sure enough, you find out they put the wrong engine in. What are you going to do? Now you got to be really crazy about things and start tearing things apart and, and put the new engine in. Whereas if they had thought about this beforehand, at the beginning of the assembly line, uh, there wouldn't have been a problem, see? So in some ways, uh, in a strange abstract way, that's what we try to do as far as health by choice. We're trying to integrate um, all different modalities, recognizing that we are, we have our own set of, uh, let's say a skill set. Look at this as mechanics, so to speak. We have certain skill sets that we're capable of, but there's no one person that does everything. It's impossible, okay? And um, even if you could do it cerebrally, you wouldn't have the time to help people. Um, so in the end, what happens is, it's better to recognize that where that patient is, is in this spectrum here. And then from that point on, then, then uh, there's going to be a certain group of people that are going to have an impact at, at that level. Okay? So obviously at the maximum wellness, it's going to be easy. Okay? But the real issue with, with that period is going to be uh, with preventative issues, which I've dealt with in the past. Um, here is... Um, the issue of the mitochondria. And this is a busy slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with slides. I'm just going to use this as something just to talk from. Um, we have what we call secondary mitochondrial disorder. Well, that's pretty fancy talk. I don't know what that means, really, uh, except for the fact that it's something that impacts the mitochondria. So let's get to something a little bit more obvious that we can handle. Mom. OK? So, this is mom, and she is the source of the mitochondria. So here's where the women take over. Mitochondria are only in the women. And I, don't, won't, I won't, won't go any more, more beyond that. I don't want to have any jokes going on here. But this is a big deal. This is a transfer of knowledge, a transfer of DNA that comes to the child through the mother. And, um, we could get as fancy as we want in, different, uh, in a different uh, discussion uh, about uh, this, but in the end, mitochondria are the source of our energy. Many people say their mother is the source of their energy, too. Uh, and let's go on. This, is, this ties in with what I was saying earlier. I'll read this out loud for you because it's hard to examine. Mitochondria in context. So mitochondrial disease may, may, rep, may present with any symptom in any organ at any age. And I'll explain to you why in, in a few minutes. Okay? It's, the, it's, the, it's actually the, the problem I think we have with most of our, with most of our chronic illnesses. Okay, so here's where, where is the energy in, used in the body. You've got um, the brain, the heart, the liver, and the kidney, and also muscle too. All right? So those are the major sources of where the energy is being utilized. And where the energy is, is where the mitochondria are. What's interesting, I didn't think about this until I was reading this, that is that when patients are, are at end of life and they're having problems and all it takes is one thing and the cascade goes really quickly and they just, the whole system shuts down. And it's always the same thing. It's, it's, Basically, it could be either one of the, all these four, brain, heart, liver, and kidneys. So sometimes it starts off with the heart, sometimes it starts with the brain. It doesn't matter. It seems those are the four basic systems that keep our bodies going. And here it says here, 7% of the body weight uh, in our bodies makes up 60% of our energy 
expenditure, which is the same four as mentioning, the uh, heart, kidney, brain, and liver. Now we're going to talk about, uh, very quickly, I'm going to go through um, how important each of the organ systems are. Um, here, the first organ system that we'll talk about is the liver. And basically, it says there right at the top, it says here, metabolism and detoxification. That is the major job of the liver, okay? Um, what uh, most people don't realize is it just doesn't filter things. It's actually creating things. It's breaking things down. It's kind of like, if you think about it, it's, it's the most um, multi-purpose uh, of the organs. One of the things that doctors will talk about is the different phases of, of um, detoxification. Now, you don't need to know much about the, the different phases and all that stuff, but just the fact that the liver detoxifies things, and if our liver isn't working well, then we're not getting detoxified. So that means that toxins are not being eliminated, Therefore, toxins are accumulating. Because they're accumulating, they affect us. And depends on what they are as to where they affect. But very often, this is where we're getting a lot of problems with um, a lot of brain damage through years. Um, and this is through uh, poor uh, detoxification. 40% of the American population has, has a liver that's kind of like OK, but not great. And you don't really know unless you went through a DNA analysis to know that. But there are a few clues, okay? The, um, remember they used to call them the slow metabolizers, that type of thing? So we used to call it slow metabolizers, but we have better names for it now because we actually have the specific reasons why. So with the DNA analysis, you can actually figure out which enzyme systems are not working now. Uh, and that's 40% of the, of the American population, which is pretty big. Uh, so in that situation, that means that 40% of the people are more sensitive to things. So it's the person who really um, very sensitive to perfume. They don't like strong perfume. They don't like diesel fumes. They don't like, a lot of aerosolized things, they just, it, they, they, uh, it's not like they can tolerate, they can't tolerate, they just don't like it. Um, that's, that group falls in that category. So, import, so the important thing here is that liver detoxifies and a major portion of the detoxification is related to the energy related to those little mitochondria there. You see the little circle ones in the gray? Um, and what's interesting, and I'm, I brought this up here because it turns out the mitochondria are basically the same. Keywords basically. That means that they, they actually become more um, subselective or more differentiated uh, to the organ they're with. So, Mitochondria from, or from uh, a liver cell is slightly different than from heart. Uh, they still have the same basic mechanism of energy, but it's a matter of how it's done. Um, here it goes here. Liver mitochondria have unique features since they are the hub that integrates the hepatic metabolism, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. It's a big deal. So that's how we get our energy. And, but I'll, I'll, so that's important because what we're talking about is Mitochondria from the liver cells are really focused on sugar. <laughs> That's what it boils down to, the breakdown of carbohydrates into sugars, and from sugars get energy. Fatty acids, yes, but sugar is the primary guy there. And uh, so now we talk about the detoxification issue again. Uh, more than a thousand drugs of the modern pharmacopoeia can induce liver injury with different clinical presentations. Um, and uh, this, uh, they, they use, you know how they have jargon for all these things, mechanism of D-I-L-I, -I. hell, I didn't even know that. Basically, it says drug-induced liver injury, which I can understand. Um, and then they go into some of the details of those toxicities. But here's the thing I wanted you to take home with, and that is, um, this is drug-induced, toxicity and um, with liver, uh, affecting liver mitochondria. What we're talking about are these medications here are not something you've never, never seen before. Look at the very top here. You've got, can't get my little pointer there, but basically you've got Tylenol right at the top, Tylenol. If there's one take home point for this, for this conference, conference today is Never take Tylenol if you drink any alcohol, period. I mean, if you, let's say you had a drink of alcohol three days ago, 
a couple beers, don't drink any, do not take any Tylenol. If you get a migraine headache uh, from, from like having a good time with the Penn Staters, hey, don't take Tylenol. So you would figure, well, then that's okay, I'll just take ibuprofen. Well, look what happens. Ibuprofen is in there too, right here in the middle. So uh, you've got amiodarone, which is a well-known heart medicine we use all the time. Um, a lot of these are medications for uh, arthritic issues, as disulfiram for the GI tract. Uh, we have um, uh, tamoxifen, salicylic acid, which is nothing more than a type of aspirin, um, valproic acid. So these are medications that are used. And um, on the handout, I get a, that's being handed out now, is um, one of them says medications to avoid. And uh, it mentions valproic acid, statins are a big one, aspirin, uh, aminoglycoside antibiotics. And this is actually better than what's on the, uh, on the uh, slide there because it also gives you what the symptoms are. Um, and uh, do you, have you all gotten the, that sheet to look at? It's, it's a take home because uh, a lot of people are going to start wondering what's going on. Um, they even have co coenzyme Q10, which is a little bit different though. This is a specific type called Q10. Um, and that has to do with a specific abnormality. I'll so medications clearly can cause disease by impacting the mitochondria. And because the mitochondria are the energy source, then the, then the organ stops working. It just doesn't have the gas to run. So and this here, this is about as complex as I'm going to get. And I'm not going to expect you to know this. This is going to, I have another talk. The final talk is going to be the fruition to come to this level, okay? But I'm giving you a teaser, okay? And what this is, this, this is actually the electron flow in the mitochondria. So here's how it goes. We eat food or we have some fish oil, whatever it is. Could be carbs, could be fats, doesn't matter. It all gets absorbed into the body. From there, it's somehow processed from uh, the gut um, and through the, um, through the uh, GI gut itself and into the bloodstream. And um, if it's working correctly, um, it'll come through without creating too much of aberrations such as allergies and things like that. Now, once it's in the, in the blood system, it's going to go through the liver and the liver is going to process this. And so at that point in time, that's where the liver is, is kind of like king because the king uh, job that the liver is going to be doing is taking uh, the carbs and breaking them down through the Krebs cycle and all that stuff we learned years ago and into basically ATP and all these different uh, things right here, um, riboflavin, all this vitamin K. So what we're talking about here is these are vitamins that are used as um, basically a, a mechanism to initiate uh, a reaction. So if you don't have the vitamins, that's the point of this, why it's circled in red. If you don't have the vitamins, the electrons don't flow, okay? So in, in that situation, it's, it's almost like you have to have all these ducks in a row to make your system work. Now think about this. Do we really have a great a great dietary plan in the United States, okay? So obviously with the way I phrase it, the answer is no. In fact, we call it a SAD program. Standard American diet is SAD. It is filled with a lot of junk, and uh, some of it is there on purpose, some of it's not. And the bottom line is, um, because of that, we have deficiencies of all these, and because of that, we have less energy, okay? Now, and this is just right now looking at the, at the liver cells. Um, you'll find out that when it comes to the heart cells, it's a little bit different. 
and I'll show that in a couple minutes here. So the take home point is not um, all these different shapes and things like that. It's really very straightforward. This, this whole electron flow that goes from there to there, that electron flow is dependent upon these vitamins. And if you don't have the vitamins, no flow. Now what I intend to do is for the, I am going to have a final lecture and that's going to go into the biochemistry and I figured that's clearly optional. <laughs> I'm not here to bore people with, with uh, biochemistry. Uh, ATP, I'll throw this in, I have to. So it's 1971, it's my first day in biology class at University of Maryland and um, my professor is Dr. Schwartz and um, He's talking about this amazing thing they found out about ATP. And I go, what's that? And uh, so this is what they found out, the whole issue of having these phosphate groups and how the phosphate groups will hold, hold electrons and then split them off based upon how many of these you have. So ATP is full of energy. ATP, ADP is the version that has dumped, dumped the electrons out. Had to throw that in. <laughs> he was so excited when he said that. It was just amazing. Okay, so now we're going to go through some stuff here that's not worth it. Did you see that picture? It's an editorial comment, I guess. Okay, so uh, we're going to get down here. Okay, get the muscle. You know, we're football guys. We like muscle, right? Okay, fine. So here's our muscle. And not too much to say about this because I don't, we don't want to be redundant. Um, but uh, I like this picture here. And uh, this is, uh, you can see how our, our aging process occurs. So we're starting off here as a young lady, and a few years later, it could be a young man, and not so young. And what's, what is happening to us as we age? And it's kind of complicated, but the bottom line is, again, no energy, no mitochondria, no energy. Um, and this goes into the specific issues of what happens so I'll, I'll read that out because it's, I, I meant to actually be able to point out with a pointer, but basically mitochondria, as we get older, the mitochondria drop in numbers and our morpholo the morphology of the mitochondria changes. And then there are mutations and then there's other things, so, um, apoptosis, which is when these uh, cells just blow apart. That's a part of the aging process. And then there's something in there that's interesting. It's called biogenesis. Sounds like something from science fiction, but it's not. Uh, what we show is mitochondria can actually be recreated through exercise. And I go, whoa, that's something. So I have no excuse for <laughs> being a half-hearted exerciser. Um, so the this whole process that occurs is, is through years. But in the end, um, if we don't keep up, I used to say, and I still say this to my patients, I go, if you don't try to be healthy, you're not gonna be healthy. It's that simple. The body is just meant to go, go down. It's like talking to a child, you know, the three-year-old, you have to tell the child what to do, and you can't expect the child to tell you what to do because it's not, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Maybe in a few years in America it will, but at this point in time, still doesn't. So muscle aging, that applies to not just simply heart muscle, but all muscle. Um, and here's something that's interesting. And I think you guys who saw or were here a couple, about a month or so ago, I talked about D3. So vitamin D3, um, uh, I'll read it out for you. It says D3 augments muscle mitochondrial maximal oxidative phosphorylation after exercise in symptomatic vitamin D deficient individuals. What does that mean? It means vitamin D actually improves the effect um, of the mitochondrial, makes them do a better job. That's what it does. So, um, and one of the reasons why is because vitamin D3 has a way of transporting electrons like everything else. It's got one of these, it, it has an amazing, uh, um, consortium, so to speak, of what it can do. Um, all patients reported improvement in fatigue after co-calciferol therapy. And that's not even the methylate, that's just a standard uh, vitamin D3. Yes? There's a good vitamin D3 story uh, 
with the, I think it was the 68 Olympics or the 72 Olympics that was in Mexico City. So Mexico City's yeah. at elevation and yeah. the athletes go there two or three weeks ahead of time. Right. And so usually in the 50s and the 60s, we saw the uh, Soviets and the uh, East Germans, they would take a lot of the gold and so forth. And they mm -hmm. actually had a program. They were doing lots of research in vitamin D3 back then. Well, that was the year that all the athletes, because they were at altitude in a hot place, everybody was replete with vitamin D3 just from the sunshine working out. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, an Olympics where Russia and uh, Germany, they did not come in first. That was also the Olympics when Bob Breen Keeman broke the world record in the long jump. 30 feet. And those are, yeah, the, he broke that by almost two feet. Usually those records that have stood, you break them by two inches or one inch, or the running records, you break them by a tenth. He broke that by almost two feet. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was a track star then at that time. So when they did 30 feet, I was doing 24. I said, oh my God, this is, it's hopeless. <laughs> So, yep, I know what you're saying. Yeah, so it was vitamin D3. It was interesting. So, yeah, vitamin D3 is something. And we still have to call it vitamin D3. The reason why is it's actually not a vitamin. It's a hormone. It affects, it's when all, all of our cells have receptors for this. And, uh, but if I say hormone D3 or something like that, people get all confused. So I just stay with it. Uh, two more things about uh, L-carnitine. Write that one down if you don't have it. Because um, L-carnitine is extremely important. Um, and uh, it has to do with the transfer of fatty acids in our body to the cells. Um, and creatine uh, is part of the, um, just the, the process of developing the ATP and things like that. To be honest with you, creatine is important, but not nearly as important as, as the uh, other one here, the L-carnitine. Okay, so I'm almost finished here. Q10, hey, this is a biggie here. So this is a nice little schematic. And it's the same basic idea. We have an electron flow, and it's going through these different, uh, these are uh, different giant proteins that take in the different um, electrons and hydrogen protons and all that. So, and here's cytochrome C, where a lot of people that talk about cytochrome P450 uh, uh, group, uh, that's what that is. So here's the, uh, the, a nice way of looking at it. Most importantly is Q10 is right in the middle, basically. So if you run out of Q10, you do run out of gas. And we see this every day. Uh, patients who take statin medications, uh, it's, it's you know, clear cut that as a part of using a medicine as a statin medication, it, it decreases the LDL production. But by doing that, it also decreases the, our own production of Q10. And for that reason, uh, we end up having uh, side effects. And the initial side effects are, we refer to as myalgias, which are basically achy, achy muscles, particularly to the thighs. But you can also get joint pain. And patients who are having those problems, we take them off the Q10, uh, excuse me, off the statin for about three months. We load them up with Q10, and then we bring the statin down to a low level, and they seem to tolerate it, okay? But if you were to stop the Q10, uh, the pain would come back. And so it's, this has been, uh, for years we've been talking about this and it's pretty much a standard issue now. We, we all understand this better now. And when you, once you look at where it stands in our energy uh, platform, so to speak, you realize how important it is. So our Q10 is, it's, we produce our own Q10. So does everybody understand how, what I was just saying? Yeah. That's a specific situation, yeah. But not in normal circumstances, no. You know, that's, that's an unusual circumstance. The, um, and the Q10 is actually like a, almost like a provitamin. It, it actually goes into another um, form of it, uh, very similar. So um, the, uh, the way to look at it is this. Supposing you think of a, uh, an old-fashioned merry-go-round. The ones in the, in, the, in the 30s and the 40s, they, they have a little monkey with a ring to it, okay? So what would happen is for each time you'd cycle through and, and, and basically decrease your LDL, okay, you're also grabbing a ring. And the ring is the Q10. So eventually you run out of rings. And then when that happens, that's when the patient starts getting the muscle aches or other side effects. 
So they can also have like a hypothyroid state uh, and some other things too, but that's later down the line. And here they talk about the, QA, the Q10 levels drop as age progresses, that's true. Um, and the final thing I'll talk about in, um, is gonna be the kidneys. So the kidney is really interesting. Um, it's a lot more uh, productive and uh, does a lot more than we think. It doesn't simply filter things out like a mesh. You know, we all say it's just filters your and the, here's, um, um, this is a um, nutraceutical, uh, salimarin is um, uh, been known for years in the alternative side. Um, and uh, this is a specific agent that uh, has helped out liver cells and kidney cells. And the main reason is because it helps out the mitochondria in those cells, okay? So by helping out uh, the mitochondria, we seem to get pretty far. And finally, this is our last section here. I'm gonna be real quick here. This is talking about bipolar disorders. So we also found out that patients who have bipolar disorders um, have a problem with um, a, uh, the mitochondria at, at the, it's, act, it's called complex one, I think it was a complex two. Here uh, they're saying complex one activity, but if we go back, sorry, there he goes. So you can see the big thing on the yellow looks like a balloon or something right here. So there's your complex one. So people who have bipolar, the mitochondria are messed up at this level. And um, so they have a, they have a difficulty uh, processing this information. Okay, so, and there, another final thing here as far as, um, uh, there is a uh, product um, that you can buy, it's called NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which is really good for um, uh, producing, um, it's precursor uh, for glutathione, which is your ultimate uh, antioxidant. And I'll lead, let you with this here, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, we feel that it's related to mitochondrial issues. Uh, the, the, it has to do with the mitochondria at the level of the axons, so they're like short-circuited, where they're going in one direction, and it's almost like the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, use of the mitochondria gets, essentially, they, they burn out because they're going in one direction only. Um, so this is with ALS. So what I've done today is try to show that mitochondria are a force to be dealt with, that um, in essence what's happening is if you would look at a mitochondrial deficiency or them not working so well, that could explain uh, why we're having our illnesses. So a person who's having a mitochondrial deficiency primarily at the level of the brain, okay, they're gonna show having some problems with mild dementia or you know, um, some early cognitive uh, dysfunction. A person with a heart naturally is gonna have a heart issue where their, their heart's somewhat weaker and uh, not able to contract as well. Um, so this is all um, another way of looking at that same tree we talked about. So we had the tree and all the different branches, but each branch was a different problem. But at the same time, this can explain why each one appears differently because the mitochondria in each organelle or each, each organ is gonna be, has, has their own job to do. And if they're failing for whatever reason, then that organ is one that goes first. And as I said before, the brain, the heart, the liver, and the kidneys, those four organ systems seem to be connected really tight. So uh, when they start going down, it doesn't take long for the next one to go. So that's why it's so important to maintain our um, uh, awareness of this, at the same time um, avoid uh, the toxins that can uh, interfere with this. So um, I'll stop right now. Um, any questions? No questions, yes. I see that chart there again where it said the number of mitochondria like in the heart and the brain. Oh yeah. Can uh, you bring that slide back? Yeah, it's about a thousand mitochondria per cell. Wow. And um, yeah, that was way in the front, right? Yeah, that was like. Yeah, I'll try to get, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can show it to you later. Okay. So um, how about you guys over here? Any questions? Nothing, huh? <laughs> Yes. What kind of nutritional support would you 
Ah. I mean, I guess it depends on where in the mitochondria the dysfunction is. That's right. And um, well, the, uh, that would be the next lecture. But at the same time, let's see if we get this here. Uh, the, um, it is dependent upon what the problem is and what also is the toxicity. Think of it this way. Um, we, the mitochondria can slow down for various reasons. You know, yeah, you could have genetic reasons from the get from the get-go, but let's push that to the side. Let's talk about stuff that we have control of. What we have control of is what we put in our mouth. Um, and our, the foods that we eat have a dramatic impact. Number one is they could be deficient in, in minerals and, uh, and vitamins, like we talked about already. Uh, number two is they could actually have toxins that are breaking things down. Um, there's a relationship between the, um, the food that we take in, let's say carbs and sugar and obesity and diminishment of mitochondrial function, okay? So that's a big deal and that's, that's something that uh, I didn't have time to talk about in this lecture here. But because um, that involves a little bit more of a, a discussion as far as how it does it. But the, 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 the take home point for that is this. People who are carrying extra weight and whose sugars are not doing well. Let's say they're uh, pre-diabetic, okay? So that means their A1C is 5.7 to 6.0, 5.6 to 6.0. That group, that subgroup there, I mean, they're in, in jeopardy, but they also, they're right on the fence. So they are in jeopardy for a lot of bad things happening. At the same time, if they improve, if they eat healthy, with all the nutrients we just talked about, okay, then they will improve their overall, their ability to handle uh, the, uh, the sugars, et cetera, and therefore less taxing on the mitochondria, okay? So um, that's an area that I think all of us are, are affected because we all have a tendency, I think most of us have a tendency to eat too much if you like the food too much, but uh, it's something they have to be cognizant of. Um, the, the other areas, um, as far as, you know, um, the heart and all that, all that's kind of pretty much straightforward as far as what organ system we're talking about. But obesity affects everything, okay? It, because it's, it's kind of a manifestation of what the sugar and the metabolic imbalance is doing. So because of that, it causes the mitochondria to, to actually start short-circuiting. And all of a sudden, instead of, let's say, having 300 horsepower, now they've got 200 horsepower. In 10 more years, they've got 150 horsepower. So it's dropping, dropping, dropping. And so you have a situation where you're, you're, the very energy sources, the powerhouses in your cells, they're supposed to be working, they're not working. And that's why you can barely move. Okay, so um, that's it for right now. And again, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a sign up sheet for anybody who's interested in more details because uh, it's a pretty heavy discussion, but I, I'll, I have a lot of information I think can be conveyed, and uh, particularly if you're into biology or anything like that. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>